Today is May 9th, 2013. My name is Teresa Beer Larson, and I'm in the home of Robert Taylor, also known as Bob. Bob, do I have your permission to record your voice and your picture today? Yes, you do. Thank you very much. And thank you for letting me come to talk to you. Tell me the date of your birth and where you were born. I was born in October 19th, 1931, and I was born in Mary Greeley Hospital in Ames, Iowa. Where was your father living at the time that you were born? Well, from we were north of 24th Street, approximately two miles, and on the west side of a gravel road. I think it's called Hyde Road right there now. There are some grain bins left, but no outbuildings, no house that's been taken down. Was it about 1933 that your dad moved to a different house? Yes, yeah. And where was, was that? And that's on facing 24th Street and Stang Road is the road that came up to 24th Street, but it was a T intersection there. Your dad was a farmer. Tell me what are some of the first farm memories that you have? Well, um, I think at that point in our life, it was pretty much like any other farm. We had chickens and sheep and hogs and some dairy cattle. And so uh, we were outside an awful lot after school, when, especially when the weather was nice, but really we were outside a lot growing up. We didn't spend much time in the house if the weather was nice. And my grandmother lived to the west about a block and a half, so we did go down there quite a bit and played games and she read to us, that sort of thing. So about age five or six, you started to school? Yes. And what was the name of your school? It was North Star School, and that was to the east, uh, approximately one mile on the north side of 24th Street. I understand it was a one-room school, but can you describe it for me? As a young kid walking up to school, what did you see? Well, it was just uh, a rectangular building, and the bathrooms were outhouses outside, and there was a pump for water and a flagpole, and I think it was on about an acre of ground, so we had room to play games and softball and that sort of thing. The school itself, when you came in, there was kind of a hallway for the hang the coats and so forth and also there was a stove where they could cook have hot meals at noon and that was in this same area. Before we talk a little bit more about the school, did you have any hot lunches there? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, mainly the ones I remember were uh, it was during the war, so they had some soup, and usually that was a split pea soup that simmered on the stove that didn't have the most desirable odor to it. The other, and also prunes, it seemed like they stewed a lot of prunes. Those are the main ones that I recall. Do you like split pea soup or stewed prunes now? <laughs> I really don't. Split pea soup is certainly something I do not order. Okay, we'll go back to the way that the school looked. Um, when you started at the school, approximately how many youngsters attended? Uh, probably around 15 or 16 usually. Sometimes there were kids in every grade, but not always, and there 
might be from one to three in each grade. And uh, the school, um, the teacher was in the front of the building, and so she kind of conducted things from there. The students, uh, older students, oftentimes would help the younger ones with some things. Uh, so it, there was uh, some cooperation then. Yeah. But it might have been kind of noisy because there was always somebody reciting or somebody talking. Well, some of that, of course, but I guess we got used to it. And, uh, but there were, for instance, music. She had a Victrola, and we always had music uh, and some art. And so it was kind of, I think, math and science and reading and English and those were the things I remember most. When you went to school, you you had to walk, but it wasn't that far a walk for you. That's right, yeah. It, uh, if the weather wasn't good or something, why then our parents would take us, but it was a little less than a mile, and so that was just the way you got there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes older children at country school would pull pranks on younger children. Were you, were you ever yeah, part of that? Yeah, I suppose I was in first grade, probably. The one thing that I remember so well is that it was in the cold weather and one of the older kids asked me to stick my tongue on the pump handle which I tried and learned very quickly that that was not a good idea. How long did it take for your tongue to release? <laughs> well, I can't remember, but I, I remember my tongue was sore. I just eventually pulled it off and some of the stung, tongue stayed there, I guess. Was the school also a center for community activities? Yes, it was. They had a PTA and, and they often had uh, oh, meetings where the parents came and sometimes they had entertainment. There was a uh, curtain that rolled up that they rolled down to when there was maybe a play or entertainment of some sort that uh, usually was part of whenever they had a, a school meeting there. Did you have desks that uh, were sturdy and you and you slid into them and inkwells and that sort yes. of thing? Yes, yep. All the desks were fastened down to the floor and so yes, we did. Everybody had a individual desk. Because you were part of a farming family, Tell me about how long your school year was. Did you get to be released from school kind of when spring came and your dad would think about planting? Well, um, because I was young and I went to this school from kindergarten or first grade through fifth grade, I, I really didn't get out. But May, it seemed like the middle of May was when classes were over and it started in probably the first week of September. We had vacation at Christmas, but Thanksgiving you maybe got off the day before. Not, you didn't go on Thanksgiving, but you didn't get off that week either. <laughs> so, and school, I think vacation at Christmas was two weeks. That's kind of what I remember. Well, let's talk a little bit about your far your dad's farming operation when you were a youngster, like from you know age say five through ten. Um, how much land did your father have? Well, our farm was a half mile wide and three quarters long, so that was two hundred and forty acres. And then there was a forty on the south side of Twenty Fourth Street 
and to the west of Stain Road. And that was kind of rolling ground, and usually uh, most of it was pasture, but we did raise some on the, the mm -hmm. northeast part of it. And the other ground was uh, row crop and hay and oats. So uh, probably about half of it was always in corn and the balance would be a combination of hay and oats, mm -hmm. pretty much. Did you early on know that you wanted to farm? Was that something that you really enjoyed? Well, yeah. I. Uh, I just enjoyed the freedom of the independence of growing up there and I liked to be outside and there were just a lot of interesting things that uh, I found interesting with uh, livestock and uh, a chance to start having some of our own livestock ourselves at a young age. and enjoyed that part of it and kind of the satisfaction mm -hmm. of raising livestock. And now your dad had some dairy cows Yes, in the 30s. Yes, and uh, he, he always had a hired man that helped with things and sometimes times, part of the time of the year there would be an additional hired help that, uh, especially in the fall during harvest of the corn, they pick corn by hand, and then probably by the late 30s, uh, they got a corn picker, mm -hmm. and you still had to open up the fields by hand because the corn picker, uh, it was you had to run down two rows with the tractor um, and the corn picker was to the, it picked to the side of that. So it took two rows. Mm -hmm. But uh, so those rows that you needed to drive the tractor on, you either cut off by hand and fed the livestock with that or else you went down and picked that by hand and mm -hmm. used it for feed. So for the dairy cattle, did you produce much milk and cream? Well, uh, my father got sick with arthritis when he was in his mid-30s and so after that he tried to use hired men because he had a dairy and milked about 22 to 24 cows every day. And after several years of frustration with hired help, why well, then he uh, sold the cows for a while. But as I got older and into high school, why well, then we got cows again. And uh, he had uh, rented the farm out to another person who uh, they farmed in grain farm mainly, but we kept the buildings and by the time I was a senior in high school we had 10 dairy cows that uh, we milked every day and so that was my responsibility to get that done. And where, did, all, where did you sell that milk then? Well, we sold it to the dairy at the university. It was called the uh, college dairy. And we, part of the, when we had the 10 cows at that time, we separated the milk and sold the cream and used the skim milk to feed the hogs. And then later on, uh, when he got a different tenant, why well, then they increased the herd to uh, where there were about 22 or 4 cows mm -hmm. that they were milking. And at that time they sold the whole milk to the dairy. And a neighbor also so took milk to this same dairy and they had a panel truck and they'd stop and pick our milk up and mm -hmm. 
all of theirs. Um, I'm interested that you sold to the um, Iowa State Dairy. Um, many people who know the history of Ames know about Moore Dairy and O'Neill Dairy, but apparently you didn't sell to them. No. Uh, and the university, I think, uh, it was probably more convenient, but anyway, it uh, worked very well for us, and they, at that time, the university, they were noted for their butter and for their ice cream and their cheese, and they had a little store there that people could buy there also, but they also had a milk rock. This was an individual, I remember Tro Dairy, or Tro Milk Route, I guess you can call it, and they delivered milk around the city and university. I can't remember. There might have been another person also that did mm -hmm. that. But. Well, I kind of got ahead because I was really interested in your farming operation. So we'll go back to um, being a young man and going to grade school. Uh, Sorry I took you on that little sidelight trip there for just a second. But uh, you had said that you went to country school until fifth grade. So where'd you go after that? Then uh, my parents took me in town. My sister, they took her in the year before to seventh grade at Central. And they paid tuition and I went into Roosevelt for sixth grade. And so that was... Uh, probably one of my major adjustments in that period of time in my life because I just uh, didn't know the kids and the classes were quite a bit bigger and so forth. But it, uh, it went very well and uh, I enjoyed going there and getting to know more kids and having the opportunity to, I think, do more things. That was a farther distance for you to go then, obviously. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. And uh, by spring of that year, well, I had a bicycle, and so I had friends in town and rode in town to see those kids and do things a fair amount. And so it was a nice experience to get to have more friends. You mentioned a bicycle and. I'm interested in knowing what kind of roads you had when you were in sixth grade to ride around Ames. Yeah. Were they, everything was gravel by then? Uh, everything was still gravel down to, well, let's see, if you went east to uh, Grand Avenue, that was paved, but uh, a lot of the other streets were gravel down to about 20th Street. I, I rode Stang Road quite a bit and then would go over on 13th Street, which was Cinder, and so, yeah, a lot of that was gravel. That would be challenging bicycle riding. Did you ever get skinned up? Well, yeah, if you fell off, it was easy to get skinned up pretty good, but uh, you soon learned to be more cautious and stay out of loose gravel and some of those things. Because I know you had an older sister and girls probably had to wear dresses. I bet she might have gotten skinned up. Yeah, she did. She certainly, learning to ride, she skinned her knees and learned mm -hmm. from experience, I guess. But learning to ride a bicycle, I remember that was kind of a challenge. Well, it would be if you just had gravel to learn on. That'd be yeah. tough. So I have you now placed in, in junior high. Okay. So, some more memories about junior high. Did you? That would be an age when you might do things after school. But you also had farming, so that might have been a tough decision for you. Yeah, and I really, um, I w did go out for track in seventh and eighth grade, but. Uh, I had projects at home, and so I was more interested in coming home. I wasn't that big of a person. I didn't really get that involved with sports. and uh, I did go to a lot of the games and so forth that my classmates were participating in, uh, 
but I preferred coming home and getting our chores done and also getting studying done at night. Your parents must have put a high priority on doing well in school. Yeah, they did. They wanted to be sure that we did well so we could go to Iowa State to college. And yeah, there was a lot of influence that that was important to get that grades up and be able to go to Iowa State. We'll take another brief little side trip because I understand that your mother was college educated and that was quite an achievement for mm -hmm. someone her age. So uh, perhaps her educational yeah. interests influenced yes, that. Her uh, and my, both my parents really, and uh, it was very important that you go ahead and get a college education. And uh, I think the fact that my father had developed arthritis and wasn't able to work as much. Uh, he always used a cane and uh, so felt it was very important that you get a college education in case you needed to do something else mm -hmm. to make a living. Uh, my mother had gone to Iowa State and graduated and taught school in, in Iowa in high schools and then she came back and got a master's degree and taught in Seattle University and also at Albuquerque in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Her family had land though here in central Iowa. Yes. Yes. So yeah. that can so right. She uh, came back and they my mother was in maybe 30 or 31 when she got married. My father was a couple years older. Mm -hmm. So um, let's, let's talk about some influences that you know, people of your generation might have experienced growing up. Um, the 1930s affected people in different ways. Of course, to some people it's called the Great Depression. Um, you and your family had agricultural support, mm -hmm. so perhaps you didn't feel the presence so much? Well, uh, I think most people in Iowa and in agriculture, if you were self-employed, felt the depression definitely. And uh, there was uh, 1934 and 5, I think it was real dry and it had poor crops. and the insects, the chintz bugs, and these kinds of things uh, were challenges that you had to deal with. Uh, but when you had livestock, uh, you had probably more diversification, which was a big help. But the chickens, the eggs were important. You took those to the grocery store, sold them, and and the cream and, or the milk farmers used that to sell to buy their groceries and a lot of, uh, I think the women all did a lot of the baking and cooking and so a lot of it you produced on the farm as far as the food and uh, I remember that the chicken feed always came in sacks that had uh, oh, flowers and this sort of thing and so they made curtains and dish towels and this sort of thing. That was pretty common. Mm -hmm. Dresses. Mm -hmm. Some of the women made their own dresses with that. What's interesting to me is um, your home now is on 24th Street in Stang and it, as it was then. And most people think of this as so city-fied, but mm -hmm. you really lived in the country. So really, yeah. you had a very rural farm experience, not more than like seven or eight blocks from what was a very thriving little town. Yeah, uh, at, I've seen the city of Ames. It, it was maybe about 18th Street and uh, 
the school district from North Star was down to 16th Street, at least on the east side of Duff. And um, so I've seen all of that area develop in my lifetime, and it probably, uh, it seems like there were about five farms that eventually, or uh, in that area, but anyway, there were about ten farms that were annexed or became part of the city limits uh, before our farm did. But, um, That's a good spot for us to pause just a second, and then let's look at a map, and we can kind of talk about from when you were a kid, where the city left off and the farms began um, up until today. We'll, we'll just okay. pause right here. Bob, we're looking at a map of Ames. And could you show me with your finger where your house is now? Okay, the house now would be 24. Right about here. Okay. And where... Where were some of the families and who lived where when? So there's you could from here, why don't you show me where the where is the North Star School? There, we'll go that way. Okay, so then we would come east on twenty fourth street and let's see, I believe um he crossed the railroad track and so it was approximately right in this location. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you were um, a youngster, I'm going to pull out just a little bit. Show me where Ames, for all intents and purposes, um, where did the city kind of end? Well, let's see. Um, I might have to put my glasses on that, here. That's but a good idea. From about 16th Street, which was down here, mm -hmm. roughly, and 13th Street, there there were some homes in this area, and mm -hmm. the really most of from 13th Street north on the west side of Grand Avenue. There weren't very many homes, there were a few. And then um, the rest of this was pretty much university and mm -hmm. also the park area. Mm -hmm. But um, And show me some of the, the areas where there were other families living nearby. Where were some of the other farms near you? For example, Morris Farm and, and okay. such. The, the Morris Farm, this is Hoover Street right here. And so their farmstead was just north of 24th Street, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a half a block. or so. And so that farm went north up to top of Hollow Road. It's now Bloomington. Mm -hmm. And over to the railroad track. Mm -hmm. And... Then um, on the south side of 24th Street was the Allen Farm, and it went south down to 20th Street or maybe a little further. And it was a half mile wide and three quarters of a mile long, and it went over to where Shaletter Village is, which is right in mm -hmm. this area. So all of this area that's North Crest and the high school and part of its housing now. Mm -hmm. But all that was one of the farms. And the Specks lived um, from Hoover, that land Walter Grove owned and it went over to Grand Avenue which is this and also on the east side of Grand Avenue, all that housing area uh, north of 24th Street was part of Walter mm -hmm. Grove uh, land. And the Specks lived, uh, well, a couple different, 
mainly just north of 24th Street on one house was on the west side of Grand and the other house was on the east side of Grand, kind of where uh, First National Bank is. Jim Speck moved the house into that area and lived there. He was one of the, I think the Speck family, there were two boys and three girls maybe. But anyway, they lived on the west side of Grand. Now this area right here, your family owned. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's where there was like pasture and rolling hill. And yeah. that's mm -hmm. kind of called the green now. Right. And then um, this is okay, Stang Road. So this is where your house is now. And you owned all of this area right here. Yeah, up, up to uh, Bloomington, Bloomington Road. Road. Okay. That was part of our farm. And then there were... Uh, there was a farm over here that uh, the Smoots owned and then eventually Fern Moore bought it and that was, part of that was pasture and Squaw Creek ran through it. There wasn't a lot of farmland, uh, tillable land, about 60, 70 acres and then north of that farm was um, Ped Kinsley owned this farm up there, which is all developed now. And then north of that, up here, was that ground was uh, in the Gilbert School area. But there was a family there, the Bogmires, and they lived there for many years. and. Two ladies, the Myers sister, owned the land, and the Bogmires were tenants on it. And eventually, they did buy a farm to the north, okay. which just south of the Ames Country Club. All right, thank you. Sort of picking up where we left off in the 1940s during World War II. Um, how did that affect your farming operation uh, in this area? Well, probably the biggest thing that I remember is that uh, because of the war, why then they didn't uh, manufacture machinery. Most of those companies were transferred over into making things for the war. And so you had to repair and have a machine or a blacksmith do a lot of the work to patch up and weld things that had been broken. Uh, you could still buy some parts, but uh, as far as new machinery in general, that was very hard to come by. And they did have, uh, I guess you'd call it the black market, which down at Rippey, Iowa, there was seemed to be access to to that, and uh, a lot of rationing for tires, uh, and also for gasoline and fuel. All those things were rationed, and you uh, you had kind of, for fuel. It seemed like there was a book of stamps that you had to use. I remember the speed limit was reduced to 35 miles an hour and uh, they also put on uh, price controls in the, the grain and so forth. There was very little volatility in prices that was pretty well controlled and they took those off after the war, so I can't remember if that was in 45 or 46, but once they took them off, why then there was a fair amount of inflation for a while. Mm -hmm. Well, that takes us up kind of to your high school years, and uh, tell me a little bit about going to Ames High School. Well, uh, Ames High School, uh, 
was, let's see, 10, 11th, and 12th grades, and so Welch Junior High, those kids came down to Ames, so they were part of Ames High School, which uh, was a relatively new school back then. I think it was built in the late 30s, and I started in 47. I was a sophomore there, and so the facilities were very nice, and uh, High school, uh, there was just a lot more activity going on, and uh, it was a, a nice time to be growing up. And well, I know you studied hard. Excuse me for interrupting. I know you had to get good grades, but did you get to have some fun? Did you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, high school was uh, a lot more fun, and, and they had parties and dances and things that uh, became a part of things. And also uh, there was a youth center downtown on the east end of Main Street, which became very popular, I would say, from the time I was in ninth grade, roughly, where kids uh, could go down and it was monitored. I'm trying to remember who it was, and I'm not coming up with the lady's name right now. But would you, anyway, would you go after school, or was it more of a weekend event? Uh, well, it was open on at least in my case, I could go on Friday and Saturdays. I don't think it was open on Sundays, but. Um, and I can't remember during the week, I didn't have the opportunity to go there then. But anyway, it uh, had pool tables and I think music there. And it had some sort of a bar that you could buy drinks, uh, pop and that sort of thing. But uh, Sounds fun. Yeah, it was very nice and a lot of kids uh, went there and I think things, they kept them out of getting into trouble, things that they probably shouldn't be doing. But it was very popular when I was in ninth grade and on through high school. Well, you were a busy person because you were studying hard and you had farm work. Yes. But you squeezed in a little time at the youth center. That's true, although uh, we did get to go to the basketball games and football games and sometimes out of town but not not too often but uh, mm -hmm. we got to do a lot of things with other kids as we grew I, up through high school. Your family uh, or at least your mother's family had land a little bit east of Gilbert and maybe two or three miles east of Gilbert and there used to be a lake up there, Lake Como. Did you happen to frequent that? Uh, lake Comar. Comar. Uh, I remember uh, probably when I was sixth, seventh, eighth in that, in that they, 4th of July, they used to have uh, programs and picnics and so forth up there. And, and later on, uh, I can't remember for sure what happened, but anyway, uh, it kind of disappeared. More what was so popular for us, really, uh, in junior high and high school was the Legist, which we used to go over there quite often in the summer for picnics, and it was really a nice park to go to, and a lot of families, and it was very popular. It, uh, as I recall, there wasn't really a fee to get in there, but during uh, probably the 30s, I think, they had the WPA, which is when uh, so much of that park was being developed, I think. Uh, those were the people that uh, the government had these projects and really did make some nice facilities at the parks. 
and it was relatively new, so it was kind of yeah. a novelty. Yeah, and really very nice. There's streams of water that kids could play in, and you could drive through. It was really nice. And they also had an area where they had uh, some animals, wild animals, monkeys, and that was about the only place I ever saw any deer as a kid, but now the deer are every place. So. They're missing their natural predators, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really want to thank you for talking with me today about growing up in Ames and watching Ames development really come up to your farm.